Welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. We're doing a series entitled A Look Ahead. We're working our way through the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This week we're beginning a new lesson, a new series in fact of 13 lessons. This series of lessons will be focusing on witnessing and evangelism. And the first lesson is in just actually entitled Defining Witnessing and Evangelism. This is the lesson for April 7 of 2012. And I would like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it's such a privilege to know you. It's a privilege to speak about you, but so many people aren't sure what to say, they aren't sure what they, how they can represent you best. May this series of lessons give us a clear understanding of how we can reach out to others in an unobtrusive way, in a friendly way, and draw them closer to your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, we've already stated, in fact, the lesson title states what the purpose of this lesson is. We're going to set out some of the questions, some of the challenges, the goals of this quarter's lessons. What do you think of when someone says, witnessing? <laughs> Spoken like the true son of an evangelist, huh? It's got more than one meaning. You can be a witness of an accident or an event, yeah. or you can be promulgating something you believe, be it religion, politics, or whatever. That's an older expression for witnessing. Aren't those similar? Well, witnessing. They are think. similar, aren't they? I didn't catch you first. Uh, aren't those similar, those two ideas? It isn't the purpose of, the idea of a, of a Christian witness yes. should be that you have spent enough time with the Bible and understanding right. God so that you, you see, okay, this is the message. Now let me tell somebody else what I have discovered in God's Word. Plus, so in a sense, it's... it's plus, in, plus applying it to yourself. Sure, absolutely. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Have you ever actually actively witnessed? Why isn't the church more successful at witnessing? Are there advantages of personal witnessing? You know, yeah. they've got to want to listen to you. If they don't want to listen to you, what are you supposed to do? Grab them by the, no. the shoulder and say, hey, listen to me. Yeah, but have they had the opportunity to decide they want to listen or not? Or have we just kept quiet? Well, but what... Let, 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 let me add, sort of focus that question. If we believe that personal witnessing is the way to go, and we're going to focus a lot on that in this lesson and future lessons, I can tell you. If we believe that as advantages, what are its advantages? What are the advantages of doing personal witnessing? By personal, do you mean... One person to one person? One person to one person, or you to a friend. You, okay, personal witnessing. Mm -hmm. it, it's many faceted. It's what they see you do in your life, your family interaction, your business dealings, the way you carry yourself, and, and direct witnessing. It's all part of it. I, I, I think that you, you open up a channel in which God can develop you and your relationship for you personally that he can't do if you don't do that. The Adventist Church has been known almost from day one for its efforts at public evangelism. We put up big tents. At one time we owned, the, I think, the two or three largest tents in the whole United States. Mm -hmm. Put them up and we challenged people to come out and there were no television and no radios and people flocked out to hear what's this new attraction down at the local tent. Well that's sort of dead in our day, a lot of it. Public evangelism has sort of lost a lot of its luster because people, it's easy for people to sit home and just you know, it's, veg it's, in front of the TV. It's just moved to TV. Yeah. The same thing happens on TV. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The decline of morals, etc. It's not safe to do those outside things in some parts of the yeah, world. Yeah, true. Well, what do you think? Should should the church find new and different ways to do public evangelism? Well, that's the problem, isn't there? They they haven't found new and better ways. Yes, we have. I, d I don't think I think that's TV the and issue. radio. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you don't have to tell me about that. I mean, I'm in TV and radio, yeah, but well, still, I still see things on the television that I've seen since I was a kid. Oh, yeah. Explained in the same way, using the same cliches, and I'm sitting there watching that, and I will feel like yawning. Mm -hmm. You're right, but I think we are more and more using some of the latest things that never were. Well, you got, you got Twitter, you got... You got Facebook, you got all these social mediums now, but still you got to learn how to use those. Well, for the you got to have something to say. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but I, I get three or four monthly ham radio magazines, and every one of them, pretty well every month, mentions Adventist World Radio and what frequencies they're on. And this is in non religious technical journals. Why do they do that? because it's one of the best programs known around the world and it spreads around the world where you can pick it up just about 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I, ha I don't want to take anything away from public witnessing, mm -hmm. but I don't think that has been the lack. Mm -hmm. I, I think the real issue is private witnessing. Yeah. yeah. Well, another way to put that is when you think of evangelism, is that the work of the pastor, or is it the work of every member? Yes. Everybody. Everybody. It should be everybody. Yeah, that's Especially the, the member, the yeah. individual yeah. member. Right. Well, it it's sort be. of the one-two punch. Uh, people are brought in by public evangelism. Then if the personal evangelism or connection at the local church is not good, mm -hmm. that wipes out any curiosity that was raised by public evangelism. Yeah, it's true. I've heard it said that if we could keep all of our own children in the church, we would have a larger membership today than, and, and even if there was no public evangelism of any kind, we would have more members today than we, we do through all our public evangelism because we're losing so many of our young people out the back door. I think that's yeah. true. Well, isn't, why, isn't, why is that? Isn't that true of every denomination? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. And we're all, we're losing young people out the door of the schools. We're losing them. Yeah. They're not getting jobs. And why do so many of the uh, people who come into our church through public evangelism, you go, you go to a church and they plan everything and they organize everything and they have a big program and they you know, 50 people are baptized and you come back a year later and how many are there? But Jesus foretold this when he says you put the seed on the roadside and some is mm -hmm. lands in thorny, um, you know, so he foretold that uh, every seed would not sprout. Mm -hmm. But I think there's too many of us have been very happy to sit in their own little corner of the world and figure, well, the, new, the newbies have sorted out and that's why they leave. Yeah. 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 Well, there's this famous text. And there's nothing here that says anything about addressing just the pastors. It says, go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Now in that passage, there are four major active verbs. What are they? Go. 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 Make. Make. Make Bap disciples, technically. Yeah. Baptize. Baptize. Teach. 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 Okay. The go, the baptize, and the teach are really subsidiaries to making disciples, right? If you think about it, the point of all those other things is to make disciples. Disciples are who? Well, disciples... By definition, a disciple is a learner, a, a, someone who's practicing your profession. So you're not... An apprentice or something like that. So he's not really talking about um, being my gang. He's talking no. about making them into students of the truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what the disciple is. So, so again, we ask the question, do you believe that that's your job? We can't Should baptize, be. can we? Is that well, saying that, or we're to lead them to the proper mm -hmm. avenue to be baptized? We can prepare them. If, the, if necessary, the pastor will help us baptize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's another thing 
that's interesting here. Evangelism, the word evangelism comes from a Greek word called euangelion, which means good news. So if we're preaching bad news, we're trying to scare people out of the as we sometimes jokingly say, scaring the hell out of people. If we're preaching that kind of message, that's not evangelism. That's not good news. So we need to keep that in mind. Well, per, no doubt that the, the greatest examples of evangelism that we could cite are the disciples after the death and resurrection of Jesus. What happened to them? Between the crucifixion and that time? Yes. The, the, the Peter who melted when the lady pointed a finger at him and the Peter who stood up a, a few weeks later in front of the Sanhedrin and said, you, the Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, the Messiah, that you crucified, you know, what happened? They went from timid to fearless. Absolutely. Literally turned themselves inside out and went for it. Well, they, they had spent some time in confession and study and prayer and the Holy Spirit came upon them and things changed. They determined that the person that they walked with and talked with for two, three years was God mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit came upon them yeah. to allow them to proclaim that. Procl yeah, to spread the message. Yep. Try to think about what would be the implications of saying your best friend is God. You know, when young people discover a potential mate, what do they say to their friends about that person? Oh, they start talking about soul mates. And <laughs> <laughs> but they're telling all their friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to me, right? Could we have that kind of a relationship with God and develop that kind of an enthusiasm about presenting the truth about Him? Well, look at some of these verses to describe what the disciples did. Acts 4.33, for example. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God poured rich blessings on them all. That's pretty clear, right? Look at Acts 5, 42. And every day in the temple and in the people's homes, they continued to teach and preach the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. Do you think when you try to understand God so that you can explain Him to others, that God does pour knowledge, helps you gain that knowledge, helps you gain the words to say, I won't, I, we don't have time to go into all the details here, but there's evidence that everything you've studied, everything you've read, everything you've heard is recorded in this gray matter up there somewhere. We just can't recall it, most of us. Uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you have proof of that? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I think the Holy Spirit, if we fill our minds with that kind of information, in other words, by beholding, we become changed. If our mind is full of that stuff, the Holy Spirit just has to know the place where He can touch to help us remember. And He will be right there with us, yeah. touching at the right time to give us the right words. Look at a couple of more passages. You can sure mess it up too, though, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Acts 2, starting with verse 36. Now, this is Peter's preaching. All the people of Israel then are to know for sure that this Jesus, whom you crucified, is the one that God has made Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, I mean, imagine, here's the Jews who said, who've been claiming for thousands of years, they're just, what are they waiting for? We're waiting for the Messiah to come. And then they hear a message like this. When the people heard this, they were deeply troubled and said to Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do, brothers? Peter said to them, each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and to your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Maybe one more, Acts seven fifty six. Look, he said, I see, and this is at the end of, of Saul, I'm sorry, Stephen's speech 
this fantastic speech found in, in, in Acts 7. And they're out here and the stones are starting to fly. And he looks up, he says, look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand side of God. And they, you know, that was just, that was enough to just lead them to, I don't know what you could call it. They, they just went completely crazy. Well, you know, to be saved, and he says, you need to turn from your sins. Uh, sins are very hard to turn from. So mm -hmm. should it have read, you need to start turning from your sins and ask God to help you to continue turning from your sins? Because certainly after that time when they said, what shall we do? And he says, turn from your sins. I'm sure that some of them kept on sinning, but maybe they didn't like to as mm -hmm. much. The King James uses repent in that place where it says turn from your sins. The crux of it is, no matter what he said, he got thousands in a day. Mm -hmm. And it was like the ripples in the pond going out. It is. I have some death. I there was, um, I, I thought there was an idea, doesn't Ellen White say something about the fact that most of these people knew about Christ? A lot of them Maybe. saw him from mm -hmm. the wall saw the crucifixion yeah. and and so there was a lot of stuff happening before all that happened also mm -hmm. and could explain why there was so many that that were baptized Jesus, Jesus himself had sown a lot of seed yeah. mm -hmm. but he uh, at that same time though she says that in that crowd were those who had never seen Jesus mm -hmm. and they they were there they had come to the to the Passover feast, but they had not seen him, and uh, they, yeah, were, they caught were caught up in the crowd. Up with the crowd, yeah. 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 Well, it would be absolutely amazing to have this person go around, heal people, teach people interesting, um, open up the Bible to them, heal people, feed people, and then their church leaders kill them and crucify them. They had to be a lot of questions in their mind, like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. So when they heard well, this, they, they yeah. knew. There's a very interesting t story told in Luke 24 on Resurrection Sunday. And Jesus decides to, instead of going to heaven and celebrating, which he could have done, to come down and walk with these two disciples. Look, starting with verse 13. On that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. That would be about seven miles. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? They stood still with sad faces. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening these last few days? I'm sure Jesus wanted to smile. He wanted to chuckle when, when he said that. He, you know, what things? You know, and, and he, he plays along with this thing. You know, Jesus, you know, with this very innocent look on his face, what things, he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. As he put his hands in his pocket. <laughs> yeah. Do you think he might have had the hood up or something like the kids do nowadays and then they couldn't see his face? I don't know whether whether God just prevented them from recognizing him because he wanted he wanted to do some other things. Let's read about it. This was a man, this man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be powerful in everything he said and did. Our chief priests and rulers heart handed him over to be sentenced to death and he was crucified. And we had hoped, we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us, and they went at dawn to the tomb, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of the angels, who told them that he's alive. Some of our group went to the tomb and found it exactly as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And of course, my question would be, have you looked through the Old Testament to find a place where it talks about Jesus coming as the Messiah, suffering and dying and then rising? Well, after Jesus explained to them what was said about himself in all the scriptures, 
beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. As they came near the village to which they were going, now here's the next stage of the story, mm -hmm. Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they held him back saying, Stay with us, the day is almost over and it's getting dark. So he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning at us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I mean, just, just try to imagine. Talk about the aha moments. Huh? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder, this is a little bit of speculation on my part, so you don't have to buy it, but I wonder if it's possible that Jesus gave them an, such a, an incredible example of how to spread the gospel how to witness at that point that when they went back and told the other disciples, they sort of followed that plat pattern, you know, in the future. And there's, there's a couple minor variations of the pattern. In general, the evangelistic sermons seem to take one of two possible approaches, depending on the audience. To Jewish audiences, where, they would, where would they turn? The, the, Old, the Old, Testament, Old Testament, of course. Yeah. That's what the Jews depended on. And they would start with prophecies from the Old Testament. That would be followed by evidence that these prophecies were fulfilled in the life and death of who? Jesus. Jesus, of course. Then came a personal testimony about the effects of those truths on the life of the individual speaker. Finally, he would make a call to the audience to respond. And I, I wonder if that wasn't more or less what Jesus did on the road. Mm -hmm. Well, in cases of non-Jewish audiences, the approach was a little different. The speaker talked about his life before he knew about the gospel not so much appealing to the Old Testament since they wouldn't know for sure what he was talking about. Then he would focus on the message of the gospel, particularly speaking about the life and teachings of Jesus. Then he noted the differences that those teachings had made in his individual life. Finally, he made a call to the audience to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and see what difference it would make in their lives. So you can see basically the patterns aren't that much different, just basically adapted to the audience that he's speaking to. So the good news about God should become such an important factor in our lives that we cannot keep quiet about it. Evangelism or personal new witnessing should be an ongoing effort in the life of every Christian. Paul has some very interesting things to say. Look, for example, at um, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Now, my version says, whoops, we just popped back. I don't know why we did that. Let's try again. Romans 1, verse 1. Why? A bondservant. From Jesus Paul. Christ. Yours says a bondservant. Mm -hmm. Mine says, if I can convince my computer to stay there. <laughs> Your computer has a mind of its own. <laughs> Look at that. I know I keep We're going to have to read it fast. Yeah, I guess we are. Are you going to go there for me? Are we having technical difficulties? Can't get there from here. Yeah. Well, let's try again. I'll try one more time. From Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus and an apostle, chosen and called by God to preach his good news. Now, that's what we're talking about. People who are chosen by, boy, it's determined to go elsewhere, isn't it? But that word servant there, what do you know? Do you know what that means? It's slave, isn't it? The, word, the Greek word means slave. Mm -hmm. And why would Paul, I mean, here's a guy who rose to the top of his nation. I mean, he was a member of the Sanhedrin at age probably 30 or 31 or 32 or something. Why would he call himself a slave? I guess anybody who is just totally committed, just driven, yeah. is, is a slave to whatever it is that's driving them. He, he had a fire burning in his bones. Yeah. Totally. And he couldn't keep quiet about it. A total turnaround. Yeah. It well, could be a way to get to, the, to, get to their audience's mm -hmm. uh, understanding, try to have a point of take off there. But look at Acts 2 verses 40, verse 42. 
boy, oh boy, my computer is. Forgive me, folks. I don't know exactly what my. Well, you want me to read it here while you yeah, work you on that? Yeah, you try Acts two forty two. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. There's a word there, steadfast. What does that mean, steadfastly? What does that mean? It didn't quit. It keeps going. Yeah. One of the challenges we have in our church is that so many people actually do get convinced. I mean, those are the people we ought to hang on to somehow or other. Yeah. They do get convinced and they do join the church. And then we sort of, oh, you're in now, fine, you're on your own. What should we be doing for those people? To keep them in the church? Nurturing them. Yeah. Nurturing, how do we what do that? What does that mean? Teach yeah, them the word how to they're teach saying. others. Yeah. <laughs> Teach them how to study the Bible more. Exactly. The first thing you ought to do, those people ought to go straight into a, into a class that goes through the Bible book by book. Mm -hmm. We ought to start with them, you know, and that ought to be just an ongoing thing. And, 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 and they should see the truth about God through all of Scripture. And then my experience has been if you get them doing that, pretty soon they're inviting their friends. And you can't be leaving yourself if you're inviting other friends to join you. I thought we were just supposed to get numbers. Just go out and bring them all in and then have this report card if, that if says, that's man, the, our church, I've got 93 converts. If, if that was God's Come goal, he's been a huge failure. If that was God's goal, just bring in numbers. I mean, what would you say about the numbers guy in the days of Noah? Or how how many <laughs> how many did Joel. Jesus have when he was at this? Not Jesus didn't have enough followers on crucifixion weekend to be ordained as a pastor. That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's. But you're right, Gary. There has been a tremendous. Uh, well, it's something we can count. It's something we can see. We want to we want to prove that we did something. Well, when you're an administrator of an organization. People look to you to say that to show that the organization is doing something. Yeah, and we could say things are going well, or things are going great, but it's so much more quantitative Impressive. to say there's 17 here and there are 7,000 there or whatever. I think I think getting back to some of what you said, the. One of the main cruxes is of new people. We need to befriend them, and mm -hmm. more often than not, we don't. I was going to say that um, they um, there seems to be set groups, oh, yeah. set groups, and uh, new people. Oh, hi, how are you? Nice, you know. And um, it's sort of like the new people have to form their own group because there's. Yeah, um, clicks. We, we, we absolutely have to get past that. Let me read one here. Okay. Uh, this is Christ Object Lessons uh, 120 and 121. One interest prevailed. One object swallowed up all others. All hearts beat in harmony. The only ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character mm -hmm. and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. The Spirit of Christ animated the whole congregation, for they had found the pearl of great price. These scenes are to be repeated, and with greater power. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be more abundant. Mm -hmm. Christ is again to be revealed in his fullness by the Holy Spirit's power. Well, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that our final message to the world is where? What, what are the famous verses that we claim? Three angels the three angels' messages. In fact, when I was a kid, they used to say, have you accepted the third angel's message? I mean, that was like saying, have you become an Adventist? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's going on in the three angels' messages? Let's look at that for a second. Then I saw, boy. I don't know, there's something going on funny here, and I don't know what it is. Really? Then I saw another angel flying high in the air, whether my computer's getting too hot or what. It seems not to 
absolutely determined not to stay on the verse I want it to stay on. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air. <laughs> Would you like okay. us to read it? Would you, you please read that for Starting me? Starting with Revelation 14, 6. And I'll try to keep on it as much as I can. Use the old-fashioned book. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge all people. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Okay, that's the first angel's message. Then the second. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. And then the third angel, verse 9. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Those who worship the beast in its image and receive the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, for any one who has the mark of its name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay. So is that good news? Well, that's the question I want to ask you. Is that good news? Mm. Well, Adventists have traditionally read those verses, and we've put them together with Revelation 12, uh, verse 17, we've got here. The dragon was furious with the woman and went off to fight against the rest of her descendants. All those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to the truth revealed by Jesus. And the traditional, the more, the more traditional reading, Norm, do you have that? 12, 17? Could you just read that for us? Uh, Revelation 12, 12 17. Um, yes. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, we've, we've figured out, we think, what those things are talking about. We believe that we are the God's end-time people because we keep all ten of the Ten Commandments. And we also believe that we are, we are special people because we have the, what? The testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19.10? Spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. Well, my version says, for the truth that Jesus revealed is what inspires the prophets. But the traditional reading is the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. But I'd like you to, um, now I'm not trying to change Adventism here. Let's just think a little bit. What was the testimony of Jesus? Thought about that? It's so, up there in the third in the three angels' messages. Well, that's part of it. But <laughs> is it revealed? The, play, the testimony of Jesus is actually talking about Revelation. Is it is Revelation twelve seventeen and not Revelation fourteen? And then again, it's in Revelation nineteen. And Revelation twelve seventeen is the last verse in the chapter that talks about what? The great controversy. The persecuted woman. That's the that's the great controversy in one chapter. Yep. All the way from the rebellion in heaven, the war in heaven, to the very end. Why do you call that the um, the spirit of prophecy? Well, I'm, let's talk about that right now. So what are these verses really about? Well, God's end time people will be a commandment keeping people who also bear the testimony of Jesus. This testimony of Jesus, this, the witness of Jesus, what did Jesus witness to? Well, it's most clearly spelled out in what we call the spirit of, we believe, the spirit of prophecy. Now, we believe that the writings of Ellen White represent this prophetic mark for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what's her major work, her opus, magnus opus? The Great Controversy. The, the five volumes oh. set of the Conflict of the Ages series, right? right? Which sets out the Great Controversy from beginning to end. And, and it um, goes over the history of the Bible. Okay, well, no. yeah, it does, absolutely. Look at John 16. What do you think about this as a, 
is a witness to the testimony of Jesus. Jesus here is talking. It's at the very end of his life. John 16, I'm going to start with verse 25. Jesus speaking, I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Is it possible that the prime witness, the prime testimony of Jesus, is in telling the truth about his Father? Well, he goes on to say, when that day comes, you will ask him in my name. Now, isn't that what was happening all through the Old Testament, the priests? were you know, representatives of the people before God and back and forth. Um, when that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and I have believed that I came from God. Now that is a striking departure from what is usually believed. Is it possible that we're that what we're looking at here is actually the testimony of Jesus? Well, look at this. Ellen White wrote this in The Signs of the Time. It was, it was published in January 20 of 1890, and it might give us a clue. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. Now, can you think of any other verses which which mentioned the whole purpose of Christ's mission to earth. But what did he say it is? To set men right through the revelation of God. Jesus came to do what? To reveal, set, the, reveal the truth about God. That's and, not the usual answer to that question. Oh, really? The usual answer is he came to make a way so that I can have my sins forgiven. Yeah. Or he came to shed blood. Um, maybe that's why maybe that's why this revelation from Jesus is unusual. Maybe it's be maybe this is why we have a, a unique message to give to the world at end time. Hmm? In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he hasn't died yet, remember, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He had finished the work. He hasn't died yet. If his purpose for coming to this earth is to die, to shed his blood for our salvation, then he's not done yet. When the object of his mission was attained, now she's going to tell us what it was. The revelation of God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was what? made manifest to men, and I would add, of course, women. Uh, that's found in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Um, it's not often quoted because people don't quite, aren't quite sure what to do with that. Well, you know, if Are Jesus, we sure what to do with that? If Jesus didn't come to the earth, how would we get a picture of God? Would we have an accurate picture of God? So Jesus was to come to the earth to give us an accurate picture of God, mm -hmm. thereby setting us right, um, clearing our understanding. So maybe having an accurate picture of God is what really saves us. Mm -hmm. So if you if by beholding we become changed, then you better hope that you're looking at the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Jesus came, according to this passage, according to the Gospel of John, according to other references, I, I could give a lot more from Ellen White, but this one's maybe the clearest. Jesus came to correctly represent the Father, to tell us the truth about God, to demonstrate that God, in fact, is the one who has told us the truth. And truth about things like, does sin lead to death? Does it really cause death, etc.? But no, that is, no, no talk of a, of a legal anything there. No. But that's not the only message that we are to bear. God asks us to give our own personal testimony. And let's look at an example of that. Look at Mark 5, starting with verse 1. Jesus and his disciples arrived on the other side of Lake Galilee. Now, Jesus has been working in Galilee, back and forth, up and down. That's his home territory. And suddenly he tells his disciples, well, get in the boat, let's travel across. Now, what's on the other side? 
A man who came out of the burial caves. Yes, but the area, the whole territory. Oh. What, what's different about territory? This is a non. There were Jew, a lot of Jews who lived over there, but this is a non. -Jew, this is a Greek-speaking, largely non-Jewish territory called Decapolis, the, the Ten Towns. Okay. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat he, boat, he was met by a man who came out of the burial caves there. This man had an evil spirit in him and lived among the tombs. Nobody could keep him chained up anymore. Many times his feet and hands have been chained, but every time he broke the chains and smashed the irons on his, of his feet, he was too strong for anyone to control him. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. He was some distance away when he saw Jesus, so he ran and fell on his knees before him and screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus was saying, evil spirit, come out of this man. So Jesus asked him, what is your name? The man answered, my name is Mob. There are so many of us. And of course, he's talking about the evil spirits. And he kept begging Jesus not to send the evil spirits out of that region. There was a large herd of pigs nearby feeding on a hillside. And this is a good evidence that it wasn't a Jewish area. Um, so the spirits begged Jesus, send us to the pigs and let us go into them. He let them go and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, imagine how much wealth that would be, mm -hmm. rushed down the side of the cliff into the lake and was drowned. And I always have to chuckle when I read, God is a lot of humor. I swear he's got a fantastic sense of humor. You know, very nice, very clean humor. But um, many of the Jews in Galilee lived and sustained their lives by fishing in the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> you just had 2,000 pigs die in the Sea of Galilee. Would you dare to eat the fish that came out of there? <laughs> yeah. So they used to herd pigs like sheep? Yeah, yeah. So they fell in the water, they drowned, they probably deteriorated. Floated and floated to the surface and probably are floating all over the place. <laughs> I mean, oh brother, that would not be a very good sight. So that was a demon possessed man. Yeah. And why would Jesus let the, the devils go to the pigs just to cause him more trouble? Well, he wasn't done. So what happened next? The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news in the town and among the far farms. People went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who used to have the mob of demons in him. He was sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. They knew this guy. Mm -hmm. Those who had seen it took, told the people what had happened to the man with the demons and about the pigs. So they asked Jesus to leave their territory. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man, who had, uh, the man who had had the demons begged him, Let me go with you. But what did Jesus say to him? No. Jesus would not let him go. Instead, he told him, Go back home to your family and tell them how much you know about the gospel and explain all the details of Christ's life. What no. the Lord has done for you. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how kind he has been to you. So the man left and went all through the ten towns, that's Decapolis, telling what Jesus had done for him, and all who heard it were amazed. Now and you he might He was witnessing mm -hmm, yeah. his own personal story. He had just a couple, two or three hours of exposure to Jesus. He's out there telling his whole story. Now, if you didn't know, if you hadn't studied the life of Christ, you might think, well, okay, that's an interesting story, so what? But what's the sequel to the story? Jesus comes back. He went later. Yes. A while later, Jesus came back to that area, and what happened? The man had paid off. He'd been talking to people. Didn't the whole village know about Jesus? Not just the whole village. People, thousands of people from that whole area flocked out to see this Jesus he had been talking about. 4,000 men, not counting women and children, stayed with Jesus in the wilderness there to listen to him for three days. And finally, at the end, Jesus says, you know, these people have been here for a long time. They, they must have run out of food. We may need to feed them. And, and the disciples who had already seen Jesus feed 5,000 people said, feed these Gentiles? <laughs> <laughs>
So you can't do that. <laughs> some of Jesus' best evangelists are those who were demon possessed that he healed. Do I Maybe. dare to mention that this man was the first Gentile missionary? The yeah. first Gentile missionary. This demon possessed man. Maybe there were two of them if you follow Matthew's version of the story. Yeah, but, and look how educated he was yeah. to to um, yeah. get to the point that he could be an evangelist. Yeah. Well, you he know, didn't go to he didn't go to Andrews or anybody. How much did he know about the gospel and about all the details of but Christianity? You know, when when he came out of that cave, he ran towards Jesus, mm -hmm. and so maybe the demons didn't want to run; they were inside him. But he took himself to Jesus, and Jesus then told the demons yeah. to get out. If the demons were in charge of that man's legs, I think they would have ran the other way. Yeah. You know, even though his, his story was simple but powerful, it was very personal, too. Yeah. It was not, yeah. not something he was regurgitating from somebody else. No. It was something that actually this happened was his to story. Him. And people knew who he was before, and so it even had more power from what he was saying. Well, so. just briefly, I don't have time to read the whole passage. Uh, look at Mark 8. What happened? Not long afterwards, another large crowd came together. And if you, if you read, if you put all the three the gospels together, you'll find out that this is he'd gone back to that area. Mark Jesus, eight, been, Mark eight. He's back into the demon possessed man's yeah. area. Yeah, his disciples. You know, he says, if if I send them home, Jesus says about the people. If I, well, I guess let me just read these few verses. Uh, when the people had nothing left to eat, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I feel sorry for these people because they have been with me for three days and now they have nothing to eat. If I send them home without feeding them, they will faint as they go because some of them have come a long way. His disciples asked him, where in this desert can anyone find enough food to feed all these people? How much bread have you got? Jesus asked. Seven loaves, they answered. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, gave thanks to God, broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the crowd. And the disciples did so. They also had a few small fish. Jesus gave thanks for those for these and told the disciples to distribute them too. Everyone ate and had enough. There were about 4,000 people. And if you read the between the lines, that was men, not counting women and children. Then the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. Jesus sent the people away and at once got into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dhammanutha. What do you suppose happened to those seven baskets full of stuff? Did the people take them home? Absolutely. They, people were scrambling for those pieces, and they went to the neighbors and said, take a bite of this. Did you ever <laughs> taste anything like that before? You know who I got that from? So they were the this, first this, doggy bags. <laughs> <laughs> the seven baskets was what they picked up after yeah. the people yeah. ate and they're, they're probably cool. took some to take home with them. Even so, yeah. yeah after they filled their pockets. Yeah. yeah. Could have been. Yeah. <laughs> well, these things suggest to us, and, and another classic example of this is Acts 22, where Paul talks about, this is the way I was before I became a Christian, this is how I became a Christian, and then this is what's, what's going on with me now. Very good uh, example. John says in 1 John 1, verse 3. Well, in fact, let me read starting from verse 1. We write to you about the word of life. It's talking about Jesus, which has existed from the very beginning. We have heard it. We have seen it with our eyes. Yes, we have seen it and our hands have touched it. When this life became visible, we saw it. So we speak of it and tell you about the eternal life which was with the Father and was made known to us. What we have seen and heard we announce to you also. What's he talking about? He's talking about his experience, personal experience, so that you will join with us in the fellowship that we have with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ. We write this in order that our joy may be complete. In other words, the person who's really had an experience with Jesus Christ is telling others, and he rejoices when they join him. Right? Well, those disciples had had a lot of beholding. Yeah. They'd had three and a half years of, of pretty steady beholding, and they had become changed. Mm -hmm. There's another story, and I don't have time to read all of it. It's found in Acts 13. I'm going to just read a few verses. In the church at Antioch, there were some prophets and teachers. Notice prophets in the New Testament. Barnabas, 
We'll hear about more about him in a moment. Simeon, called the Black, Lucius from Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the governor, and Saul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul to do the work to which I have called them. If you go back to chapter 12 and back to chapter 11 of Acts, you discover that the, church, the, the gospel is just exploding in this city of Antioch. And God is saying, we can't leave all this great stuff going on just in one city. We've got to spread it. So he said, Paul and Barnabas, I'm sending you. And they went to the island of Cyprus. They witnessed there. They went on into Syria. I mean, went on into what we would now call Turkey and traveled through those areas. And uh, go, the rest of the story is, 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 in the, is in the book of Acts there. Is that sort of like leaving Loma Linda? <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> well, what? You're getting too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it. us away. <laughs> <laughs> so what Love happens? It. What happens when you get that kind of situation? When you get too many people gathered, too many Christians gathered in one spot, pretty soon somebody's complaining, right? You remember the story of Acts 6. Sometime well, later... Well, sometime later, as the number of disciples were growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews, the ones who spoke Aramaic. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds, etc. So what did the disciples do? They appointed deacons. They didn't say, okay, let's one of us, let's five of us serve tables. They said, find some other people. We're busy doing what? Preaching. Preaching, witnessing. We're busy witnessing. So they chose five Greek-speaking people. Stephen and Philip are the ones we know the most about. And both, both of those witnesses, what did they do? I mean, both of those deacons, what was Stephen known for? Preaching. He preached so powerful in the, in the, in, in the synagogue of the freedmen, one of the Greek-speaking synagogues in the Jerusalem area, the Jews became really upset because nobody could answer his, his, you know, his, his statements. He would stand up and, and when he was done speaking, his, his, his arguments were so convincing that people were just flocking to become Christians. And the Jews said, we can't have that. So, of course, he was taken before the Sanhedrin and all, all ended up being, being stoned to death. Are you saying that the deacons were also preachers? Well, that is an interesting point, isn't it? A lay I mean, preacher. A both of preacher. these, yeah. Both of these deacons became some of the most powerful preachers in the work. Philip went to Samaria. And it sounded like they, they responded to a distraction, trying mm -hmm. to get the disciples to do other things. Yeah. You know, they get away from what they were doing, but they appointed these deacons, and then they started going like crazy. Exactly. Well, in order to be an effective witness, one must clearly understand what he's witnessing about. In the case of Christianity, this means we must clearly understand what we believe and the basis in the Bible for those beliefs. Can we do that? Well, not necessarily because that demon-possessed man knew he had been healed, but he certainly was no expert as far as we know about the Bible. So if you have an encounter with God and God does something for you, um, you can uh, talk about that. Yeah. Well, how many of us can give a Bible-based study explaining our most, and I'm going to come back to your point in just a moment. How many of us can give a Bible-based study explaining our most important Adventist beliefs? And if not, how do we become better grounded in Scripture? Well, telling our own personal story is the easiest part. That's what you were talking about. It is also often very effective. This would consist of, first, a brief account of what we were like before we became Christians, if that's appropriate, then a short explanation of how we came to be Christian, and finally, a few words about what Christianity has meant to us since becoming a Christian. One of the best examples of this technique is, of course, the story of Paul. It would be wonderful for each one of us to spend some time thinking about our personal experience and decide what we would say in the form of a personal testimony of this sort, and maybe practice on some friends. So why is it that so many in our world now take the future life and heaven ser so few in our world take the, the, the story of heaven and the future life un not seriously? Well, before you leave that, um, in addition to our personal story then, it is very important for us to get a set of Bible study guides mm -hmm. and uh, so that we are prepared to give a step-by-step. -step. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, then that's my next point. Some of us may not feel qualified to give a full Bible study. So what can we do in preparation for the time when we may be qualified to do that? There are several possibilities. We could hand up people a card, giving them an internet website that they could go to, or give them a small tract to try to answer some of their questions. Or two, we could simply tell them our own experience. That's the personal witness thing. Three, with a little more practice, we should be able to give a careful explanation of some specific teaching of the church and answer their questions. Or four, with a little practice and perhaps an outline in our hands, we should be able to give a simple Bible study on a subject or question in which they're, of which, in which they're interested. In this day and age, I think you can go watch a DVD with yeah. these people. Sure. As we have seen, evangelism and witnessing are two aspects of the ways that we can spread the gospel. Witnessing may require nothing more than telling our own personal story. The word evangelism is commonly used as dis is a description of the process of clearly and persuasively telling the good news about Jesus in such a way that the listener is convinced to become a disciple and even a disciple maker. This raises the question of the relationship between witnessing and evangelism. And I hope many of us had this experience of, of we might have found a friend, we've talked to them about the gospel, and then there's an opportunity when the church has a public evangelistic effort. We bring our friends with us, and thus the two are sort of melted together. And that's, that's the best way. So what evangelistic programs is your church currently involved in? Are you a part of those evangelistic outreaches? Can you think of new ways that you could reach out to your community? Methods that the church is not cur currently employing. Remember, Matthew 28 says every one of us are supposed to be involved. As his representatives among men, Christ does not choose angels who have never fallen, but human beings, men of light passions of those they seek to save. Christ took upon himself humanity that he might reach humanity. Divinity needed humanity. God needs you, for it required both the divine and the human to bring salvation to the world. Divinity needed humanity, and that humanity might afford a channel of communication between God and man. Desire of Ages, page 296. The challenge is set before us. Every one of us has been called to be a witness. Maybe it's your personal story. Maybe you're familiar enough with the Bible that you can go on to give a Bible study. But think of a way that you can be a method of reaching out to your neighbors. See you next week.